Hello, Isabel. Hi there. Good to see you. And you. Isabel Saipala, you're a uh, consultant dietitian. That's correct, yes. At the Royal, at the Royal Brompton. The, not, not that many of you around, are there? I, I'm sure there are other consultant dietitians, but I'm not sure there's any in allergy. In um, allergy in particular, is, yeah, no. Yeah. And you run a clinic twice a week? Yeah, I run a, um, three clinics for adults with food allergy at the Royal Brompton with um, together, well, mostly together with my colleagues, but I do some clinics on my own, uh, seeing GP referrals um, for suspected food allergy. And so with today we were going to talk about uh, pollen food syndrome. Mm -hmm. There's been some recent work done around this and um, uh, it, it's kind of confusing. It, you know, what what is it? Is, is it uh, is it to do with pollen? Is it to do with food? Is it a mixture of both? <laughs> Explain a little bit more. OK, so pollen food syndrome is what it says on the tin. It is about pollen and it is about food. Um, Pollen food syndrome is a food allergy uh, that uh, affects people who are allergic to pollen. So they usually have hay fever and they may not all have hay fever, but they can still be sensitized to pollen. So in other words, they could still have a positive test to trees or grass, uh, but they can still get pollen food syndrome. And what happens basically is that um, some of the uh, proteins in raw plant foods like apples or nuts or carrots um, are very similar to proteins in pollens. And mm. so pollen antibodies recognize those proteins and they think you're eating pollen rather than food and they react to it as they would do if pollen went up your nose, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's kind of an allergy mistake. So you're not really allergic to the food, you're allergic to the pollen, and that's causing a reaction to the food. And actually, <clears throat> when you have a food allergy, you're allergic to, say, peanuts or milk, you will react to peanuts or milk. When you have pollen food syndrome, you could react to a huge number of foods because they have these similar proteins in. So although it's often a very mild allergy, it, it can be very troublesome because of there could be a lot of foods involved. And is it is it only raw food? If it if it's cooked, does that kind of pollen go away? Well, if you cook the foods, and many of these proteins change their structure because they're unstable proteins. And so for many foods, especially fruits and vegetables, these proteins are altered and people can eat them. So typically, you know, I would say, well, if a raw apple causes you symptoms, what about apple crumble? And usually the answer is no. It's a very good question asking about apple crumble. Um, but, um, you know, I would say there are some foods. Um, we know carrots and celery can, they can, these proteins can refold back into their normal structure. So for some yeah. people, they can actually have reactions to cooked foods and nuts uh, can also still cause problems when they're roasted. And that's because some of these proteins are uh, more resistant to heat. And there may be foods that we think are, we, we kind of don't see them as raw, like soy milk. Um, and soy milk can actually cause severe reactions in people. <clears throat> so um, how, how would you know then that you've got the, that, that the pollen food syndrome and not a soy, soy allergy or a, a, an allergy? How, you know, how would you distinguish from one uh, from the other? Uh, yeah, well, the first thing is to think about uh, the age of the patient. You know, um, it's not true to say that uh, children don't get pollen food syndrome. They do, but they're usually a little bit older and they've usually got hay fever. Um, so age is important. Um, you know, young children under the age of five won't have pollen food syndrome or very rarely. Um, the, the other thing to say is, um, you know, what kind of symptoms are we talking about? With pollen food syndrome, the symptoms are often very mild, oral symptoms, you know, itchy mouth, tingly mouth, a little bit of swelling, bit of itching in the throat. It's a bit like, as I say, having hay fever in your mouth. Um, so 
there are you can get severe reactions, but they are less common. And the other really important thing is um, these reactions happen very quickly after you start eating the food. Sometimes immediately you bite into an apple or mm. you, you chew and swallow a cherry. Um, so they are usually they're quick, they're mild and they are generally confined to the, the mouth and the throat. And the foods are usually raw or they're very they're they're not usually in processed foods. It's, so, you know, people can eat, they can't maybe hazelnuts, but a lot of them can eat um, a very famous chocolate that contains hazelnut. Um, so that's that's the kind of thing that we would look for in the history to help us understand whether this person has pollen food syndrome or an allergy to that specific food. Um, but there is one other thing, and that is that, um, you know, nut allergies generally start in childhood. So if, if, if somebody has a history of reactions to nuts as an adult, um, usually it's pollen food syndrome, not always. Cashew nuts, pistachio nuts can cause allergies in adult life. But, you know, that's the kind of thing we would think about. So presumably you'd, you'd advise somebody to keep up something like a food diary, uh, note what causes that reaction how severe the reaction is i think if people are um, you know typically when a gp refers a patient the patient will come and say i've had reactions to apples um, plums and hazelnuts and um you know so i think reading a good allergy history that the gp has taken is often all i need to know i usually know what the diagnosis is before i even see the patient. Um, I think keeping a food diary isn't necessary because people always know if the reactions happen straight away. It's not like other food allergies or food intolerances, which may be slightly delayed. Um, you know, it's always, oh, I can eat an apple and I get these symptoms, but I'm fine if it's cooked. So, you know, th there are very specific things that they can think about and, and look for. I think the problem comes is when they do have more severe reactions, you know, like I had a soy latte and, and I, you know, had difficulty breathing. That could be <clears throat> pollen food syndrome. It probably is pollen food syndrome, but you cannot completely discount a soy allergy, even though uh, if that occurs in an adult, it's very rare. Because, you know, nut allergies, soy allergies, they tend to start in childhood. So a pollen food syndrome is more associated with an adult, particularly if if, if it's a, a, a new allergy. I think no, no it, it definitely does occur in children. I, I think in adults, you know, what's usual about adults is they've never had problems with these foods before. I see. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and they have hay fever and it's, you know, often they've had hay fever for years and then suddenly develop pollen food syndrome, and we don't really understand why. For children, <clears throat> I think, you know, if the child is, say, from the age of seven or eight onwards, um, yes, it's quite possible they have a nut allergy, but it's equally possible this is pollen food syndrome. And uh, what often happens in children is, of course, they have skin prick tests, um, which is, you know, the normal... Mm -hmm. uh, allergy tests for children so we don't have to take blood. The problem with skin prick tests if you are pollen allergic is a lot of those nuts will be, be positive because they're of the cross reactivity. So it does make it slightly more difficult I think in a child. I think it's easier to spot in an adult because we know nut allergy is very rare in, in adults. New onset. That's, yeah. that's, that's fascinating. Thank, thank you, Isabel. I mean, it it's, it's just raises lots of questions, I would imagine, for people who either have a, a nut allergy or um, you know, a, a similar allergy that we've just discussed now. Well, that, that, you know, do they then think, well, actually, is it or is it a pollen food syndrome? No, well, would... of course, you, you can have both. You, can have, you both. can have a nut allergy that started when you were a child and then you get hay fever and then you get pollen food syndrome. So it's not unusual for people to come to say, oh, I've always had a nut allergy, but suddenly I'm starting to react to uh, raw fruits 
or you know raw carrots and um you know for example they might say oh i i had some carrot sticks and hummus now you might think oh it must be the hummus but actually you need to consider the the carrot sticks as well <clears throat> in that scenario the the other issue with older children and adults is that they've often made lifestyle choices about food especially uh, becoming vegetarian or vegan and um, that means they have exposure to a lot more potentially a lot more foods that could cause a reaction and that can be quite concerning uh, for them and if they're young young enough for their parents um, you know to think well if I can't have nuts and I can't have soy um, and I can't have a lot of fruits what am I going to eat so I think that's you know it, you know, for all this, it's a mild condition, mm. it can be very difficult sometimes for people to manage uh, or they get very anxious because they don't, really don't know what, what else is going to cause a problem for them. Very interesting, very interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, on the uh, Anaphylaxis UK website, we've got the fact sheet and all the other additional information, but it's been great to talk to you about it and, and educate me at least and hopefully inform others listening to this video uh, more about uh, pollen food syndrome.